let's talk about separatism. Separatism is the feminist idea of living separate from men. In the 1960s and 70s, this was often realized through women's lands, where when large groups of women bought land and formed female-only communes around the United States. In the years since, interest in women's lands has decreased or else have a forced inclusivity based on identity, and the number of operating female-only communes has even, even further diminished. For many, the concept of living in a rural area with other women, away from major cities and easy access to many of the pleasantries of life, is not one they covet. The central purpose of women's lands is to decenter men from the lives of women. However, one does not need to go full separatist in order to achieve this goal. Other methods include living in female-only homes or apartments, making an effort to buy and seek services from women-owned businesses, and keeping men at a distance in your personal life. All of these choices stem from one radical notion, often unspoken, but still integral to the basis of radical feminism. Men are dangerous. The suggestion that men are dangerous and that one should keep a distance is a radical notion that has often split the feminist community down the lines of sexuality. This, too, is nothing new, as despite lesbians partnering with heterosexual women for goals that serve to benefit opposite-sex-attracted women more, lesbians have often been left behind by mainstream radical feminism. Lesbian feminism specifically arose out of lesbophobia in the women's liberation movement. As stated by Yamaset Westerbend in Lesbian Feminism, 1960s and 70s, lesbian feminism largely emerged in response to the women's liberation movement's exclusion of lesbians. As the second wave of feminism picked up steam during the 1960s, feminist discourse largely ignored lesbianism. Some feminists harbored hostile attitudes towards lesbians. Some viewed lesbianism as a sexual rather than a political issue. Others believed the project of feminism would dismantle strict sexual categories and would release a natural polymorphous sexuality, making lesbian politics irrelevant. Now as leader at the time, Betty Friedan, referred to lesbianism as the lavender menace. This phrase referred to her view that incorporating lesbianism in the feminist agenda would undermine the credibility of the women's movement overall. This is not to say that lesbian radical feminism in this period was perfect or should be replicated in modern feminism. In order to make lesbian involvement more palatable to straight feminists, who often viewed lesbians as being male-adjacent for their attraction to women, lesbians attempted to paint lesbianism as being asexual, and focused on sensuality instead of sexuality. Eccles argues that, the introduction of sex troubled many heterosexual feminists who had found in the women's movement a welcome respite from sexuality. Perhaps in response to heterosexual discomfort, lesbian feminists distanced themselves from the sexual aspect of lesbianism, and assured feminists that lesbianism involved sensuality, not sexuality. Thus, radical lesbians had to persuade feminists that lesbianism was not simply a bedroom issue, and that lesbians were not male-identified boogie women out to sexually exploit women. In essence, lesbian feminists tried to untie lesbianism from sex so heterosexual feminists were more comfortable, but they still had to find an effective way to address the accusation that their masculinity was somehow complicit with men and patriarchy. Lesbian feminists responded by distancing themselves from stereotypes of masculine roles, maleness, and patriarchy. One way they were able to do so was by disentangling lesbian sexuality from heterosexuality and reconceptualizing heterosexual sex as consorting with the enemy. They capitalized on dominant assumptions regarding male sexuality, including ideas of women's romantic and nurturing sexuality versus men's aggressive sexuality. They were then able to draw a distinction between lesbian sex and heterosexual sex, claiming that lesbian sex was pure as snow since it did not involve men. For example, the male seeks to conquer through sex while the female seeks to communicate, and lesbians are obsessed with love and fidelity. Some argue that this point of view alienated heterosexual feminists as the presentation of lesbianism as the ultimate form of feminism posited feminists who continue to interact with men as being lesser. The concept of the Harry Dyke feminist comes from this conflation. However, this view ignores that there is a difference between political lesbianism and lesbianism as a sexuality, and ignores that there is a true and observable danger to being with males, and that despite the best intentions, every woman who has ever been hurt or killed thought that she had found a good one and that men have become adept at hiding the bad parts of their personality, to hiding the danger until the women around them think that they are safe. As a lesbian, it is hard to see any redeeming qualities in males. N wait, let me rephrase. As a lesbian, it is hard to see any redeeming qualities in males worth the danger of allowing one in my home or in keeping close company with knowledge of how men treat women. I've noticed men on TikTok, their favorite little like jab for me, this is how they get me where it hurts. They say, you're a sexist. You're like biased against men. And the funny thing is like, yeah, you're like my biggest natural predator. Like anything's going to happen to me. If something's gonna kill me, it's more likely that it's a man than anything else. 
and you're like, why are you sexist? Why not just go up to a deer and be like, I've noticed that you're really biased against the guys in camo hiding in the bushes. You have this aversion to them. It's like very close-minded and weird. Not all men are a threat to me. I'm not like afraid of all of you. I don't think you're all going to kill me. Those men I'm not afraid of, by the way, the good ones, those are the ones who are not in my comment section right now typing to remind me that good ones exist. Besides the statistical stuff, you haven't really earned my respect. Your legacy as a population is not great. You love to remind us you built every institution that makes up our society. And I'm looking around and I'm not that impressed. I feel the comments already. It's like you guys never took history class. You didn't help us build society. It's not like women helped. You didn't let us, babe. Their favorite thing to say in the comments is, well, if all the men are gone, let's see how you guys maintain the sewer systems or open a jar of pickles. Is that all you think you're good for? Is like manual labor? We could figure it out if we needed to without you. And many of us have. Many women do those jobs. And if you were all gone, we'd just pick them up and do them. But the fact that your first thought is like, who's gonna deal with the plumbing? Is that all you think you really have to offer? Let's review, okay? So you built most of the institutions and the systems that are now crumbling around me. You pose a greater threat to me than anything in the world. You think your God-given right is like to run society. You think that's your God-given job and you're fumbling the job so bad. And when we criticize you for it, you can't even be a good sport. You can't laugh at yourselves. You can't admit fault. The saving grace of people who fuck up a lot, everyone knows, is that they can be self-aware and they can laugh at themselves and take a joke. So it makes most of you, on top of all this shit, insufferable to hang out with. And then all the good stuff that you've contributed to the world, you men, you're so cocky about it when there's no proof that we wouldn't have done it better if we were allowed. In conclusion, of course I'm sexist. It is the logical thing to be after evaluating the evidence. This is not a matter of opinion, but rather a logical judgment based on previous experience, as well as statistics and research that supports this conclusion. For example, in 2005, 1,181 women were murdered by an intimate partner. That's an average of three women every day. Of all the women murdered in the U.S., about one-third were killed by an intimate partner. According to the National Crime Victimization Survey, which includes crimes that were not reported to the police, 232,960 women in the United States were raped or sexually assaulted in 2006. That's more than 600 women every day. Other estimates, such as those generated by the FBI, are much lower because they rely on data from law enforcement agencies. A significant number of crimes are never even reported for reasons that include the victim's feeling that nothing can or will be done and the personal nature of the incident. Pregnant women in the United States die by homicide more often than they die of pregnancy-related causes, and they're frequently killed by a partner. UCLA psychologist Neil Malamuth found that between 16% and 20% of male students said they'd commit rape if they could be certain of getting away with it. That's at least 1 in 6. When he used the phrase, force a woman to have sex instead of rape, the percentage jumped to between 36% and 44%. That means for nearly 2 out of every 5 guys, the key deterrent seems to be the fear of getting caught. The issue stems from the centering of romance as being the end-all, be-all fulfillment within a woman's life. Other choices, like makeup, shaving, or transitioning, have all been subject to criticism, as has the notion of choice inherently making an action feminist. In these topics, it is easy to come to a consensus that the world we live in, the patriarchal and misogynistic world that we live in, has an impact on our actions, behaviors, and thoughts, regardless of if we recognize that influence or not. However, when it comes to the belief that a fulfilling life inherently involves romance with a man, it seems as if heterosexual women are incapable, or at least for the most part resistant, to the concept of misogyny impacting that belief. It is important to note that romantic love being sold as a major life goal directly benefits men. According to Quartz.com, married men are more likely than single men with equal education to be among the top 1% of earners because of the benefit of women's unpaid labor. A growing body of research, both in the United States and the developed countries, find that married men earn between 10 and 40% more than otherwise comparable single men. But the most sophisticated recent research suggests that marriage itself increases the earning power of men on the order of 10 to 24%. Men are literally buying their downtime with women's work. Working mothers get about 30 minutes of downtime each day, compared to 4 hours for working fathers. Across the globe, women work longer and harder than men, proving that the problem isn't a gender division of labor. It's a tendency to expect that women will simply do more work. Divorce makes women happier. Divorced women say that divorcing improved their happiness compared to married life. Husbands create seven additional hours of work for their wives each week. Single women are happier, report higher levels of pleasure, and live longer. No matter who works inside the home, for how long or how much they earn, women do the majority of child and household labor. Bad marriages increase women's risk of heart disease.
Even when women work full-time or the lead earners, they do 70 to 80 percent of household labor. On average, women who are married spend an average of 2.95 hours daily on housework compared to 2.41 hours for unmarried women, a difference of about 32 minutes every day. A married mother supports spending 10 minutes less daily on leisure and 13 minutes less on sleep daily. Men in the United States spend 150 minutes a day, about 17 and a half hours a week, doing unpaid labor. Women spend about 243 minutes doing unpaid labor each day, about 28.4 hours a week. When you add both paid and unpaid hours together, women still work longer hours. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that Americans earn an average of 26.82 an hour. This means that if men and women were compensated for their unpaid labor, men would earn an additional $469 a week and women would earn an extra $761 a week, which comes out to nearly $40,000 a year. The reasons for this are not entirely clear, but may be tied to deep-seated societal views about what is expected of a wife and mother, reinforced by moms' own expectations about themselves. Thus, moms put housework ahead of their own leisure and sleep because they feel personally accountable for providing a home for their families. When lesbians or bisexual women suggest abstaining from dating men, it highlights one of the differences that sexuality plays in feminism. Opposite-sex attracted women tend to view any criticism of male partnership as a personal attack, and have often used lesbophobic rhetoric in turn against those critics. Personally, I believe that women who can choose not to partner with men shouldn't, as it is a hazard to their health, safety, and happiness, and provides no material benefit. Radical feminism focuses on women's liberation with the knowledge that men oppress women. Yes, all men. All men benefit or perpetuate the patriarchy. Most do both. Radical feminism does point out the dangers and detriments of being with men. Radical feminism demands a strong response in turn. At the very least, it demands self-reflection. If one does not want to consider that yes, partnering with men is dangerous and that choosing to do so and one calls herself a radical feminist is at best naive and at worst hypocritical, that's fine. Radical feminists are a minority, and even if you disagree with this point or choose to ignore it, there aren't any consequences from the community as a result of that choice. Radical feminists are not forcing you to become political lesbians. Lesbians do not hold oppressive power over heterosexual women, and in fact, the greater world upholds the belief that romance is one of the main goals in a woman's life. All one has to do to find affirmation of that belief is to log off. It seems that many women that see misogyny as something very far removed from them, and this is a hindrance to feminism. The abuser, the rapist, the harasser, the sex dealer, the guy who buys sex, who goes to whorehouses, even the men who simply make misogynistic jokes without being effective aggressors. They are away, not here. Misogyny is not here. Of course, my boyfriend is not a misogynist. My brother is not a misogynist. My friend is not a misogynist, nor is my co-worker or schoolmate, nor my cousin, nor any other close man, because misogynist men are far away. They are in the newspaper article, and they're in the TV report. Not here, not near me. This logic is flawed because it assumes the idea that only some men are misogynistic, not all. Therefore, only a few men support the patriarchy. Now tell me how this is possible. How an oppressive system can be sustained by just a few people. How a system that kills, rapes, exploits, traumatizes, indoctrinates, controls, and assaults every woman on earth can be sustained by some misogynistic men. If I went around asking, the overwhelming majority of men would naturally tell me that they are not misogynists. But how is this possible? Very simple, it's not. Because yes, every man is a misogynist. Every man is an oppressor. Every man benefits from the patriarchy and oppression that women suffer. Yes, even the men closest to you. And they don't have to be effective aggressors, because before the practice, misogyny is an idea. Yes, your boyfriend is a misogynist, and your brother, and your friend, and your coworker or schoolmate, all the men you love and admire, each one of them. We were sitting around one day, we were shooting the scene, and there was this porn video that was going around called Two Chicks, One Cup. We were sitting around a table, and the guys started texting it to each other, and watching it, and laughing. And then they started saying, oh, Callie, that looks like you, that's you. Every one of them individually was a friend, but they became a wolf pack immediately. And I'm looking around, I'm the only girl. And I was like, no, seriously, knock it off. I don't like being called a shit-eating whore. And they doubled down. And one of the people at that table at the time was a very, very close friend. I was looking over going, he's got the most power of anybody in this room. All he's got to do is say, hey, leave her alone. That's all it would have taken. Like, no grandstanding, no fist fights, no nothing. Producers, directors, first ADs, all standing around, all seeing this, all hearing this. It was a moment, and this happens as a woman walking through the world, when all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm way more vulnerable than I realized I was. It is from this understanding, which is one of the core realizations of radical feminism, that separatists suggest separation from men.
And while it is true that it is not the option that everyone wants to choose, it seems as if there is a constant debate, a constant push to consider separatism a pipe dream instead of an applicable solution for some women. Some women, not all, in the same vein that some women will choose to put their feminism in their back pocket when it becomes inconvenient, and that others will choose to devote their lives to the cause. Separatism is not for the faint of heart, nor is it feasible for most. A more realistic goal, perhaps, is to push the idea of women being independent, with high standards and the strength to be able to leave relationships whenever there is a red flag. In other words, the goal should be to become a woman able to stand being alone rather than being in an unhappy or detrimental relationship for the sake of being in a relationship. However, to suggest that radical feminists should not question and criticize heterosexual partnership is to demand that radical feminism water itself to become more palatable to the masses. It's an attempt at holding women's liberation hostage for the sake of loosening radical feminist ideas. We can't fight our oppression if we can't discuss our own participation in it, even if we're not the primary offenders. Critical analysis is not hate, nor is a logical conclusion that you dislike. I would offer the same advice to a lesbian in a country where homosexuality can lead to a death penalty. If it puts your safety at risk, no matter how much you may like it, you should consider not taking an action that can cause you harm, or at least mitigate and understand the risk of doing so. It's akin to smoking cigarettes while aware of the cancer risk, or drinking excessively when at risk of becoming an alcoholic. Can you smoke without ever getting lung cancer or developing an alcohol dependency? Sure. But there will always be a chance of harm because you are choosing to do those options despite the harm they may cause. A large part of radical feminism is understanding that just because we choose to do something, just because it feels good, doesn't mean that it is good for you. The idea that lesbians have it easier is untrue. Rather, due to the low number of same-sex attracted women, the pressure to conform and partner with males, and the juxtaposition of lesbophobia and misogyny, many lesbians have come to terms with the possibility that they may never find romantic partnership, and therefore have had to decenter romance from personal actualization. Instead of romance, we should instead center close platonic relationships of women around us. Feminism is meant to center around women's liberation, and is best practiced when focused on uplifting other women instead of focusing on centering men in our own lives. Women have accomplished great things when we choose to focus on one another. Take, for example, the village of Amoja in Kenya. The village was founded in 1990 by a group of 15 women who were survivors of rape by the local British soldiers. Amoja's population has now expanded to include any women escaping child marriage, FGM, domestic violence and rape, all of which are cultural norms among the Samburu. One of the unique features of the Emoja community is that some of the more experienced residents train and educate women and girls from surrounding Samburu villages on issues such as early marriage and FGM. It is through word of mouth that girls know where to turn to when faced with abuse, marriage, rape, and ostracization. It is through the efforts of the women in this village that they are able to educate other women and girls, and provide for them hope for the future. This village contains no men but plenty of young children. Without being bound by marriage, tied to a man's whims by law, women still hold relations with men and yet are able to take on roles they otherwise would be denied based on their sex. Even the selling of beads and the bustle of tourism provides opportunities that would have otherwise been out of reach. Another example is prohibition in the United States. While many may protest and dislike the concept of banning alcohol, myself included, religion and family were two of the only realms in which women of the times could be able to have a voice. By leveraging claims of God's will against the excessive use of alcohol and prostitution, women attempted to decrease the chances of their husbands catching STDs from other women and passing it on to them, drinking away family wages, or becoming abusive under the influence of alcohol. Although not market-lead feminist action, the combined work of women across the United States was able to enact a change that, while temporary, served to protect the safety and interests of women. This is a mostly hypothetical debate anyhow, as, again, a radical feminist cannot force you to do anything. We do not hold any spear of influence, and lesbians certainly do not, not over OSA women. The separatism debate is cyclical and returns every year to the same debate. I think that every woman should consider the danger that men may pose. I think that self-proclaimed radical feminists should critically think about the inclusion of men in their lives and ideally remove them. I am aware that this is a conclusion that many opposite-sex attracted radical feminists will not agree with and as a logical, practical compromise, I think we should at least be allowed to discuss the concept of separatism, to have that option available to women, and of course, to continue to discuss the inclusion of het marriage and het partnership in radical feminism. I know plenty of opposite sex attracted women who are involved in radical feminism who have found a way to balance their feminism ideals with their relationship. But if we're never allowed to criticize it, let alone talk about it, how are we ever going to find other solutions that would allow for more egalitarian partnerships between men and women? especially when every time we try to talk about it, it just turns into infighting. This, dear viewer, is where we part. I'm aware that this is a pretty provocative piece, and I stand by it. 
I've had this discussion with other radical feminists who are bisexual and opposite sex attracted. We can agree, we can disagree, this is what I believe, this is my conclusion, and I look forward to your reactions to it. Um, I did decide that this year I wanted to try doing a radical feminist fanzine. I've done a lot of them over the years, mostly for fandom, but I think I'd like to start up another one for radical feminism because this is the thing that I really care about this year, more so than my previous obsessions with unnamed fandoms that I will not mention here. <laughs> if you'd be interested in participating, um, it is in the community tab. Um, you're welcome to apply. You can send in literally whatever you want, pictures, art, drawing, poems, posts, whatever. The point is just to have conversation, to have some kind of physical thing in your hand that you can say is a radical feminist modern piece of literature. I want to feel like we're doing something here, not just talking, not just me shouting into the void, not just us talking to each other in shadowy back rooms. I want to feel like we're actually having a conversation that matters. So like I said, if you're interested in participating, the link is here. Um, I also have Patreon set up, uh, buy me a coffee because haha, I'm perpetually poor. Um, and if you have any video suggestions, I do have a list, a list of suggestions that has been growing for quite a long time because I am incapable of writing unless the inspiration hits in the exact perfect way. <laughs> and as you might have noticed, I've missed two upload days, in particular because I'm now applying to grad schools. Um, I'm trying to find out if I can get into any schools in Europe because, you know, you got that free college. And yeah, I apologize for some of the lateness. There'll probably be a couple more missed videos in the near future, but hopefully you guys don't mind too much. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please leave them in the comment section down below. I'm aware that I was talking fast and weird in this video. I was a little bit, um, had a little blood sugar when I was recording most of it. I didn't feel like re-recording. So um, yeah, I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye!